evening. I'm Sav Jones uh, and welcome to APTN National News Weekend. In Manitoba, Lake St. Martin Chief Chris Travers has been charged with a number of sex offenses involving a child. And a warning to viewers, the following information may be disturbing. Lake St. Martin Chief Chris Travers has been charged with sexual assault, sexual interference, and possessing and making child pornography. The alleged offenses took place in December of last year. Winnipeg police arrested Travers on February 1st. He was later released. Police say the alleged victim is an elementary school age child. Travers has been chief since July of 2022 after serving on council for many years. Last month, a group of elders gave him a letter demanding his resignation. Lake St. Martin is a member of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs as well as the Southern Chiefs organization. Both groups say they don't comment on criminal matters involving chiefs. Last week, Chief Travers asked for an interview with APTN to talk about issues in his First Nation. He mentioned allegations but wouldn't say what they were. He did say he reached out to the AMC for help. I was told I'm on my own. And what I, what, I, what, I said, what I said to AMC was, there, there, there's no, there's no, there's nothing in place for, for, for men in, the, in, the, in this society that, that are wrongly, wrongly accused of anything. And, and I shut the door, the door was shut on me. None of the charges against Chief Travers have been proven in court. His next appearance is July 3rd. It was recently announced that two Prince George RCMP officers who had previously been charged with manslaughter with the, Dale of Dale, uh, sorry, with the death of Dale Culver had their charges stayed. First Nation leaders in the province are outraged. The family has been calling for changes in the justice system for years. APTN's Lee Wilson reports. The family of Dale Culver, a father from the Wet'suwet'en and Gitsan Nations, have spent almost seven years calling for justice. Following his death, during an arrest in Prince George in 2017, Debbie Pierre is Culver's cousin and explained the heartbreaking process the family has been going through, dealing with levels of the justice system to find answers. Ensuring that Dale does not become just a file number or a case number. Uh, he's an individual that um, um, that is deeply loved by many people, and um, and we do, we cannot lose sight of that. In 2023, the BC Prosecution Service charged two RCMP officers with manslaughter, Constables Paul St. Marie and Jean Francis Monet, as well as three obstruction of justice charges against Sergeant John Asubio Cruz, Constables Arthur Dahlman, and Clarence McDonald. Following recommendations from a police oversight body, the Independent Investigations Office, who recommended charges in 2020. Last week, the family was hopeful, but frustrated with the delays and lack of clarity. Our family has no trust right now in policing. And it, it pains me to know that my immediate family that live in Prince George, where this incident happened, they are looking over their shoulders. How is that safety in Canada? On Friday, the BC Prosecution Service announced a stay of the court proceedings on the death of Culver in a public statement. The BC Prosecution Service announced today that there is no longer a reasonable prospect of conviction regarding charges that have previously been approved against two members of the Prince George RCMP. The document states the Crown had questions about Culver's cause of death. An initial pathologist who recommended blunt force head trauma contributed to his death. A second pathologist disagreed with the initial assessment, determined the cause of death, acute and chronic effects of methamphetamine following a struggle. In a press release, the BC First Nation Leadership Council expressed outrage over the charges being stayed, calling it categorically unacceptable. Once again, the justice system has let First Nations people down as it fails to move this case forward to trial. And I question the ability of the current system to deliver justice in a fair and an equitable manner. We will continue to follow this developing story. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Kitimat. 
A First Nation in the Yukon is breathing a sigh of relief thanks to a recent Territorial Court of Appeal decision. That decision dismisses an appeal by the Yukon government, which would have permitted mineral exploration in an area of great ecological importance to the First Nation. Sarah Connors has more. The First Nation of Nacho Nayak Dun is celebrating what it says is a landmark victory. The Yukon Court of Appeal has dismissed an appeal launched by the Yukon government. At the center of the case is Satagay, or the Beaver River Watershed, an area of untouched wilderness on the First Nations traditional territory. In 2021, the government signed off on a mineral exploration project which would conduct exploration activities in the watershed for 10 years. That approval didn't set well with the First Nation, which does not yet have a land use plan in place. That same year, the First Nation took the government to court, decrying what they say was a lack of consultation when it came to approving the project. They won the case in January 2023. But in November 2023, Yukon government appealed, arguing the judge erred in their decision and that it did adequately consult with the First Nation. However, Tuesday's decision disagrees, stating the judge did not err. Nacho Nayak Dun Chief Donna Hope said in a release, the decision shows Yukon government acted unlawfully and dishonorably by approving the project in the first place. She hopes it sparks a shift in how the territory approaches treaty implementation. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Thanks for that, Sarah. We need to take a short break now, but we have more stories still to come, so stick around. Last weekend in southwestern Nova Scotia, fisheries officers arrested a Mi'kmaq family for harvesting elvers because the elver season was cancelled by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans about a month ago. However, the family says they will never stop fishing. Angel Moore reports. This video posted on social media shows John Paul, his daughter, niece and grandson arrested for unauthorized elver fishing. This comes two weeks after two Mi'kmaq fishers in southern Nova Scotia allege fisheries officers left them stranded with no footwear hours from home. They never took our boots and they, they, they wanted to take our phones but we wouldn't let them. And, and if Cheyenne never showed up, we would have had to walk. That's because DFO officers seize this Jeep as part of their investigation. It belongs to Paul's niece. Another relative, Cheyenne Francis, filmed this video when she arrived at the scene. I got a big knot in my stomach because, you know what, the only reason why they're doing this now is because they know that we do this to feed our families and they don't like that. Paul says that will not stop his family from fishing. We have our own management plan and we follow that and on our reserve, our chief and council guide us and that's the way I'm always going to fish. I, I listen to my chief and council. I don't listen to DFO, I'm sorry. In an act of defiance, the family went back out harvesting elvers Monday night. It was a quiet night with no fisheries officers in sight. But the catch was not as much as they hoped. We, we come here to fish elvers, man, and we're going to fish them. It's our treaty right, and we're not going to stop. You could take all the vehicles we have. If we have to get horses and ride horses in here to elver fish, we will. The federal government closed the 2024 elver fishing season, citing conservation and safety. Francis questions the closure and says safety is an issue when the Mi'kmaq harvest lobster. But yet they're going to close down this season for Alberts because of safety. Why didn't they do that in 2020 when it was more of violent, there was more violence being transient, being at that period of time in 2020 than there was last year or any time on any river. One kilogram of elvers can be worth up to $5,000. The Mi'kmaq harvest elvers to earn a moderate livelihood. Francis says the closure does not impact treaty rights. 
because they closed the season down does not mean that our treaty rights has stopped at any given time. Our treaty rights is always going to be there. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans confirmed to APTN News on April 6, fisheries officers arrested five people who are under investigation for violating the Fisheries Act. One vehicle was seized, fishing gear and 2.54 kilograms of albers were released back into the river. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Southwestern Nova Scotia. A Niska mother and her son had a troubling experience in a British Columbia restaurant on his birthday. Now they want to raise awareness about the cultural importance of braids to Indigenous people. APTN's Lee Wilson has the story. Keegan is a Niska, Gitsan, and a Heisla boy. He recently celebrated his sixth birthday. Keegan wears long braids, something his parents chose to honor their ancestors and family who attended residential school. His mother, Sheree Alexander, allowed him to pick a fun activity for his birthday. He wanted ice cream. It was at Dairy Queen in Kitimat in northern BC, where she says their day took an unexpected turn after interactions with staff after Keegan made his order. And then she kind of giggles and she goes, well, what did she want to order? And I said, he, my son, would like to order an ice cream cone, one plain cone. And she giggles and she looks back like that to her coworkers. And then she says it again. Alexander says her frustration grew as DQ staff continued to mischaracterize Keegan, even after being corrected several times. And it broke my heart and I wanted to like get angry and upset, but I kept my composure because I thought maybe she didn't understand. And then the third time it was just being rude. Alexander created a social media post about her experience and filed a complaint against the restaurant through email. She said she was not satisfied with the franchise manager's initial response. We would like you to come in for, uh, so we can apologize. You, you can have lunch on us, but you need to delete your post all in one breath. And I, and I asked, I was like, so is this an apology just to delete the post or are you guys really sorry for how you made my son feel and my family? APTN News contacted Dairy Queen Canada. They in turn contacted the franchise owners who then provided a statement about the incident. Upon learning of the incident, we immediately contacted the customer and together with Dairy Queen Corporate, apologized and are working to make things right. We're also implementing training for our employees to ensure our restaurant exemplifies the respect and appreciation we have for all people and cultures. Keegan's family hopes businesses across Turtle Island can take their bad experience as one to learn from. They are hopeful training and awareness can make a difference. I think like everybody should be aware that First Nations boys do wear braids and it's not only the young boys, it's the young men and the older generation that all wear braids now and it's so beautiful to see everyone joining together like that. Snotty Nose Res Kids, the Heisler rap duo, supported Keegan. They created a social media post on why they proudly wear their braids. <laughs> Lee Wilson, AP10 National News, Kitimat. A residential school survivor shares her journey on the big screen. We'll have that story for you after this break. Stay with us. A swampy Cree elder says she spent a lot of her life hurting herself because of the treatment she endured in her childhood years. And now she has decided to take her life back. With the help of Black Badge Studios, Betty Ross is sharing her journey on the big screen. With more, here's T.R. Wheatley. I came from a world where I loved <laughs> and was loved. It's been 72 years since this Swampy Cree elder from Pimichikamak was forced to attend residential school. Now she's sharing her journey home in this 45-minute documentary called Return to the Falls. Elder Betty Ross and this Betty Ross returns to Sugar Falls in between Cross Lake and Norway House in northern Manitoba for the first time since she was ripped from her family. 
This is a significant place for her because when she was five years old, her custom adopted father brought her here to give her life teachings from the four directions. Before the residence of school, I found my own sanctuary. Uh, and I used to go and sit on a rock. It was very secluded. It was very calm. I felt so uh, protected. I'm sitting on uh, Mother Earth, and I used to talk to the bugs, to the little animals that came, the trees, everything, nature. Pretty soon I, I, I started dancing with them, the dance of life. Looking back now, she says these teachings carried her through a hard life. She's proud of the family she raised and displays pictures all over her house. Ross never knew her own relatives. Ross first attended St. Joseph Residential School in the north and then was moved to a day school. From there in the 60s, she was scooped and forced to move south. They shipped me over here in Winnipeg, St. Joseph's, no, no, sorry, uh, Cineboy Residential School, where I graduated from in 1968 because that was my goal, because I went through a lot of uh, atrocities in the systems. They looked down on me. She suffered spiritual, mental, sexual, and physical abuse, including a beating that's affected her entire life. Because I can't hear from my left ear to this day, uh, because I tried speaking my language. This documentary is bittersweet because Ross speaks a lot of Cree. Being able to retain her language and culture is what the director wanted to focus on. Our focus right now is to take this documentary and, and, and let it have a, an educational angle. We would love to see it for her story to be shown, this film to be eventually shown in schools across the nation, across Turtle Island, um, so, um, and, and beyond. But it's an education tool. There are some reenactments from her childhood memories, but it also shows what Betty Ross's life is like today. She recently received a Manitoba Jubilee for her life's work, including educating young children around Winnipeg. Today, in my line of work as elder in residence for Seven Oaks School Division, I am so honored to be able to have that contact with the, the, the very young generation, elementary school students, because you know why? I'm allowed to be a child at their level. Ross is also greeted by community members and leadership alike in the dock. Pimichikamak Chief David Monia says the community is benefiting since she made the trip home. And she attends our community to talk to the survivors. And I think a lot of people gravitate towards her because she's so well spoken, right? And the history that she has people can relate to it. Ross and her director share this intimate moment watching the documentary one last time together. It's about to premiere in a Winnipeg theater, and after that, the plan is to start taking it to film festivals. Director Apo Erkis is a non-Indigenous person himself. He says sharing stories like this are vital to share with all races. When I hear the truths of people like Elder Betty telling her stories, how can you not be affected? How can you not, how can you ignore that? Sorry. <laughs> um, it, it affected me personally. It's time I said goodbye to this space where I suffered trauma for many years. Enough is enough. I'm going home. I'm T.R. Wheatley, APTN National News, Winnipeg. The National Indian Residential School Crisis Line is available for survivors and others who might need support. That number is 1-866-925-4419. Hundreds of well-wishers were on hand last Saturday at the River Cree Resort and Casino on the Enoch Cree Nation in Alberta. They were there to celebrate the 80th birthday of Chief Wilton Littlechild, one of the most accomplished persons in Canadian history. APTN's Chris Stewart has more. It was a night to honor the accomplishments of Chief Wilton, Willie Littlechild. Master's degree in phys ed, law degree, medal-winning athlete in swimming, hockey, and triathlon, helping create the North American Indigenous Games and the World Indigenous Games. Member of Parliament, Order of Canada, twice, 
four Tom Longboat Awards. The accolades go on. Irene Warren, who calls Chief Littlechild brother, put together the celebration of his birthday and accomplishments. Many guests flew in from all over Turtle Island to be here. Jody Calhoun Stonehouse, who was running for the Alberta NDP leadership, emceed. There is no way anyone could do what that man has accomplished. His work on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was decades in the making. He was a former commissioner with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. All of his work on the 94 calls to action. This man has changed the reality of First Nations, Métis and Inuit people in this territory and in this country. To open the door former the AFN Chief Perry Bellegarde was on hand. On behalf of himself and current National Chief, Cindy Woodhouse Nipenek. He's just done so much. He's a mentor, he's a role model. He's kind of like how to do it. You know, he's a survivor of residential schools. He was one of our TRC commissioners. Like, the, the man is amazing. And so tonight we're surrounding him with family and friends. Just to say thank you, Willie. Happy birthday, Willie. We love you. And, and many more to come. Senator Patty Lubican Benson told a story of Wilton's role in the 1982 Constitution Act. Willie traveled to London, England to appear before the British courts. The goal was to delay the patriation of the Canada's Constitution until the treaties were recognized in the constitutional documents. It took two years and the raising of concerns before an international audience, including the United Nations and the British Parliament, by both Indigenous activists and lawyers before the Canadian government finally agreed to include Section 35 in the Constitution of 1982. And we have Willie to thank for that. And longtime friend and Olympic gold medalist Billy Mills honored his friend with stories from their time together in sports. You admired him, but to compete against him, you learned from him. And, and to know him is to love him. And I think tonight is a beautiful example of the lives, Willie, that you have touched. And what brings us all together in common, we all love Willie Littlechild. After, people lined up to get a short conversation or photo, myself included. I asked him what his favorite moment was. I think just sharing the evening with family, I think it really is touching because in residential school, of course, that was the impact was separation of family. And to have everyone come together as families and then as a community family is just really special. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Enoch Cree Nation, Alberta. Thanks for that, Chris, and a happy belated birthday to Chief Little Child. Well, another episode of ABTN National News Weekend has come to an end. For news anytime, please check out our website at aptnnews.ca. I'm Sav Jonesa, and from all of us here at ABTN News, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Take care.